Markets around the world are remaining incredibly resilient. The Dow Jones just had its seventh consecutive winning day in a row, and US markets are about 1% from new all-time highs. So what keeps this market going? Today, we're going to talk about that as well as the recent bond auction. It saw pretty good demand and we need to talk about the implications it will have on the market. But we're also going to be talking about initial jobless claims, earnings, and both his latest charts. Do they see more upside as we approach all-time highs? We've got a lot to talk about. Let's roll the tape. Welcome everybody to the Daily Recap Show where we talk about stocks and the financial markets. My name is Chase. Guys, we do a daily recap show every single day. We talk about stocks and the financial markets, right? We're trying to hit 10,000 subscribers in May and we're almost there at about 9,000 subscribers, just under 9,000. So I need you guys to like this video and then hit that subscribe button. Do that for me. And let's get to 10K in May. Quite the day here in the market, we saw software and semiconductors were the only real sectors that were down here today and even when you look at software there was a huge portion that were green and flat so they did it. the market flows did seep into software as well as semiconductors just a little bit but you do have to look at it the big guys crm intuit ac and ibm did take it on the chin stuff like nvidia and abgo that did lead flows for software and semiconductor to the downside and that did put pressure on the tech sector despite stuff like apple and microsoft putting up quite green days, 1% here for Apple and Microsoft. But other than that, guys, excluding a few earnings mishaps, stuff like Airbnb, it was green across the board. Tesla did put out a red day, don't get me wrong, but it was pretty much green in almost every other sector. Also, we saw industrials put out a very, very good day. Caterpillar right here up 2.11% as well as Home Depot. And that was the reason why the Dow Jones absolutely outperformed the S&P 500 as well as the NASDAQ today. But hopping into individual sectors, look at the best performing sector right here, GDX, gold miners, right? So that's part of the material sector, as well as XME, XLE, XLB, all returning upward of 1%. These are all in the material sector, right? Then we also had ITB and then XLRE and then utilities right here. Now utilities is pretty much energy. It's definitely a commodity driven sector. So the top six, top seven sectors were either rate sensitive sectors or a commodity driven sector. So they really led the rally today. And that had to do with a couple of things we saw in the bond auctions, the yields came down. If yields are coming down, cash is less attractive. People are gonna to wanna to buy gold, wanna buy silver, wanna buy commodities. And that's why we saw this trade we did today. But it wasn't the only trade. Look at XLI, XLP, XLV, XLF. You take those gains any day of the week, anywhere from 0.75% to 1% on a day, especially on a day where the S&P 500 only returned nearly half a percent. And that was led by the big guys. Technology, you know, look at XLK, IGV, and semiconductors. They were either flat or quite negative here on the day. And again, led by the big names. Now, part of the reason why this happened was the fact that we are actually in positive gamma and earnings are coming in strong. And despite all of the reactions we've seen in the big names, the fundamentals under the hood, everything is really strong. What helped the rate cut narrative here today was actually that jobless claims came in weak, but not so weak to spook the market. 231K versus 210K. And then we also had a very solid, strong 10-year bond auction that helped yields move lower. So this helped lead yields move lower. This helped yields move lower. That's good for equities. That's good for rate-sensitive sectors. That's good for commodity-driven sectors. And coupled with the fact that we're in positive gamma and strong earnings, what you really get is a market that just buys, dips, sells, rips, and we just make higher highs, higher lows towards the end of the day. And that's exactly what we saw. Let me show you on the charts. So this is a five minute chart of the S&P 500, sort of right around here, right around here. That's when the market opened. And you could pretty much see that from the get go in a positive gamma environment, we made a low, right? And then it's just higher lows, higher lows, higher lows, higher lows, higher lows, all the way to the pretty much the end of the day where we close at the same time, you know, we make highs, 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 an equal high, higher high, what you get in a positive gamma environment. But before we hop onto the daily chart, let's actually look at the overall market. So you see some very clear things, a positive day for the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, the Dow Jones, you know, they were up a lot. And again, that had to do with Caterpillar, that had to do with Home Depot, really helped that index quite a bit there. The RSP up 0.84%, outperforming even the NASDAQ and the SPY and really performing just as good as the Dow Jones and up here in the after hours as well. Look at Midcap's S&P 600 IWM. We covered their earnings in yesterday's video or the day before that, guys very, very strong 
momentum year. And then we also saw growth outperform value. Insanely strong trade year to date, particularly in the broader market. Look at the Dow Jones and the RSP and some of these smaller names. That's exactly what you want to see. Very, very broad based gains here in the market today. If we actually pull up a chart of the 10 year, go on the daily chart, you can actually see that we were pretty red on today's day. This is just the after hour figures, but we're sitting at a 4.45 10 year down from the highs of 4.73. And we had a very solid red day down 0.87% here for the US 10 year. And we actually did see bonds gain as a result. You know, the TLT up 0.49%. I do believe, and on my weekend video, I said we want to be buyers of duration. We want to be buyers of TLT. And had you taken that trade, you'd be up about 2% now. And I do think we're probably going to head to the $100 TLT sitting at the 90 level mark right there. So very, very good stuff from TLT. I do think risk is skewed to the upside. I think the majority of the move in yields are done. You know, many people right here, you know, they start calling for like six, 7% yields. That's when you know the move is over. I said, we're going to move lower. I said, get into TLT. And that's proved us very, very prudent so far. Uh, and we also saw quite upbeat action here in high yield, I guess, as well as corporate bonds, but the majority of the move was, uh, you know, these longer dated government bonds. We saw gold uh, actually uh, move up ever so slightly, sort of getting to this range to break out. That's what I said on the weekend video. We're going to get to this level right here, break above, use our support, and then we can go for uh, all time highs. This 23.93 area right here or an all time high close. That's what I said. Silver was actually kind of following gold, but it has actually been outperforming gold for the most part, looking to break all time highs very, very soon. Very rare you actually see silver leading gold. And then we have the DXY. It came down ever so slightly, still down from the highs in May. So it does look like this pullback was just nothing but a relief rally that tends to happen in markets. And then crude oil, I think we're still balancing at the $78 range, but I do think $78 to $88 is probably the peak for the rest of the year. This can actually still provide us with quite a bit of volatility. Don't get me wrong. But I do think that this is the range and anything below this range, I think, you know, politicians are going to like that. They're not going to care about that, especially leading up into an election. However, you know, companies with like $60 break even oil, it's really going to start hitting them that no issue at all. But let's hop on the S&P 500. Let's go to the daily chart and we could see something. So 5200, the call gamma resistance. This is the zone right here that we said is going to offer strong resistance. It looks like we're breaking through and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Because if we just break through and go break all time highs, we are long. I said we want to be adding exposure right here. And I'm happy to be wrong on a trade like this where we just keep making money. If you're wrong on a resistance level and it breaks right through and you still have your exposure, yeah, you may be wrong. You still made more money. And that's exactly what you want to see. But what I do think the, the, the most likely outcome is that we probably just balance at this range, you know, shake out some of these weak bulls who like entered right here, make them nervous, and then go ahead and break all time highs. Uh, once they capitulate and get out of their positions. We are about 1% from all time highs right here, guys. And that's very, very telling. That just goes to show the strength of the market and the underlying fundamentals. Earnings has been very good. And it does look like this pullback was nothing more than just a pullback because, you know, we sort of did pull back, hit this bottom right here and then make lower highs as well. And pretty much, you know, breaking very key resistance levels. That's what we did right here with this 5200. We're moving higher. Now, again, we can just rally or we can just balance out. But I do think that risk is skewed to the upside right here. Now, at the start of the week in the weekend video, the plan was to be buyers of pullbacks up to the 5100 level anywhere in this range. That'd be good to enter. The market just didn't give you that opportunity. It did here at the start of the week. You could have get in, but, you know, it's been what four green candles in a row. And that probably means we will go higher. I do think that all pullbacks now, especially breaking above this 5200 level in positive gamma, We'll just be met by swift buyers. This was a trade I gave you well in advance. Right about here, I said we're going to pull back to the 5,000 level. We did bottom very, very quickly and had a swift move to the upside. And this is the thing, guys, when I say events, when I say bottoms are events, tops are a process. Look at this chart, right? We made our way at a 5% pullback, pulled all the way down, and then had a massive, massive, very quick solid rally, right? Whereas when we made our way all the way to the top right here, you know, we put in a high. We then tested that high again and put in a low at a volatile candle and made our way all the way down. This is sort of like a head and shoulders, right? There was like three opportunities to test this top. Whereas right here, there wasn't three. There was just one. And this is what I mean, right? Tops are a process. Bottoms are a very, very quick event. And, you know, it's, it's evident right here. And that's why every 5%, guys, 
uh, on a pullback in the S&P 500. You want to add exposure to the index or your favorite stocks. And even with your favorite stocks, every 5% pullback, you do want to add exposure, maybe a bit more than 5% in single stocks because they can be a bit more volatile. But there you go. So what do I expect for the rest of the week? Well, the plan is still the exact same. We want to be buyers on pullbacks to 5,100 looking for all-time highs, but you should really already have at least 95% of your exposure in this area. The market did actually give you an opportunity here, here again, and here again to add. So it did give you three opportunities and higher high opportunities. So if you're not already long, I wouldn't really enter here. You probably just want to sit this one out or pop into some value names that are just didn't participate and are looking to play a, a catch up trade on. Other than that, guys, everything is looking good for new all time highs. And that is bullish. The bull run, the melt up, like I've been saying for a while, is alive. All right, guys, looking at the double A, double I sentiment survey, sort of like a staple now. Every single week we look at this and that's just the thing with investing. You got to stay consistent and you have to do the exact same thing over and over, especially if it provides you with alpha. And looking at stuff like this with a huge pool of data is really, really good. Now you can see a couple of glaring things. The very first thing is that bearish sentiment in the last week has actually gone back into this low to mid 20 range, but we did see neutral sentiment tick up as well as bullish sentiment and it's very easy to see what actually happened a lot of people here which were in the bearish camp moved into the neutral camp moved into the bullish camp and that just left bears chilling on their own there at 23.8 percent with 35.4 percent of people in the neutral camp and 40.8% of votes here are bullish. Very bullish stats, both for the bullish side and the neutral stats when you look at it compared to the historical averages. And in every single case, bulls are on the upside, neutrals on the upside, and the bears right here, not quite what they used to be. And that's why we're seeing the movement we are in the market. And that's sort of that dip buying opportunity, just because bears are far and few between. But looking at a couple of other measures of sentiment, this is the consumer sentiment survey. They asked a bunch of consumers constituents, is it a bad time to buy a home? And this is the percentage of respondents that thought it was a bad time to buy a home. 76% of individuals said it was a bad time to buy a home. Of that 76, about 58% said it was a bad time to buy due to high interest and tight credit. So high interest rates are really having a tangible effect on the housing market. And we know this because the housing affordability index is at all time lows, lows not seen since before even the 1990s. At the same time, we're also seeing home builder sentiment here at the absolute lows. However, doing a bit better than the housing affordability index, and that just has to do with immigration, supply and demand. However, still at very compressed levels, as you can see, I mean, excluding this situation here in 2020, probably have to go back to like early 2015 to see very similar sentiment here in home builders. And even at the lows just a couple of months ago, again, excluding 2020, you'd have to look back to as far as maybe 2012, 2011. You know, this was the GFC recovery. All righty, guys, let's dive into earnings. We have earnings here on Thursday. We had Warner Brothers, Plug Power, Sendel, Coronas Group, Roblox, Marathon, Dropbox. So not a whole bunch of big names. A lot of the big names here reported on Tuesday, on Wednesday. And it has been quite a volatile week. Software took a real hit. You know, a lot of these names, uh, Shopify, Uber, Affirm, uh, Airbnb, Celsius, Disney, you know, they all took a, a massive uh, dive here after their earnings release. And today we're going to have a look at a company that's not on yet, but a company that I've actually held for a little bit called GCT Giga Cloud Technology. Now, I actually advised I was going long in GCT here on the 14th of February on Valentine's Day. However, I did get out of the trade because it, it's quite a volatile stock. All my stops were hit in all portfolios, net gain 38%. This was on the 19th of March, so I hold it for a month. It's never my plan to hold trades this short term. However, it's just the nature of the market. Now we're going to look at their earnings. Giga Cloud earnings, pretty good earnings, very good earnings. Actually, they beat on EPS here, 84 cents. The market was expecting 63 cents on sales of 251 million. We were expecting 245 million. The stock was up like 1.33% here in pre-market trading. This was recorded in the pre-market, but the stock is up like 15% in the last week. So compared if you put that into perspective as to what stuff like Uber or Airbnb did, which double beat as well, 
you know, this is a very good result because it's been a very volatile earnings season here. A couple of other news, GCT is officially domiciled in the USA. That's very, very good to know. That's just uh, more security there for shareholders. And they actually raised guidance for the second quarter as well. So very good earnings right here. And they actually did their earnings on time. Unlike last earnings season, it was part of the reason why I got stopped out of my positions. Market didn't like the fact they reported their 10Q late or their 10K late and they got sold off for it. But great earnings here from Giga Cloud. And yeah, this company is probably just going to keep on growing. And you know, they actually have a bit of a tailwind to them. I mean, if oil prices do continue to come down, this is a company that's going to benefit from that. Literally, it has the same benefit as low cost airlines. If oil prices continues, you know, $78 and below, this company uh, will literally see immense amount of margin expansion. And you know what's crazy? When oil was trading at like $88 in Q1 and they reported earnings, they actually had margin expansion on their freight side as well. So this company is doing something right. Absolutely crazy. I'm bullish on the stock. I don't own it, however. All right, guys, we're going to dive into earnings analysis for the S&P 500. So for the last two to three weeks, I've been showing you the S&P 500 earnings scorecard. It's giving you the daily update of where we sit with earnings, because at the moment, this current rally is driven by the fundamental and the macro. Those two things go hand in hand. And earnings is the biggest part of the fundamental trade. Now, we're going to actually look at Fundstrat's earnings scorecard. Just a bit of a different take I thought I'd give. They have very similar data to me, but a little bit different in some components but you can definitely see that the overall consensus is that earnings is coming in really really good on an absolute basis the s p 500 according to fundstrat is reporting 6.2 percent earnings growth year in q1 2024 this is blended earnings growth my data says 7.2 percent so you could then assume we're looking at about a six to seven percent earnings growth depending on whose data you look at here in the s p 500 81 percent of constituents beating analyst estimates going into earnings that's eight percent surprise to the upside and the s p 500 is reporting 55 dollars and 67 cents in q1 earnings per share very very positive stats right here at the same time, Ned Davis research show us that the earnings beat rate is very, very elevated. Now, remember, Fundstrat had 81%. Ned Davis research here have it at 78.9% for the most recent quarter. My data has it at 77%. So you could say that the truth is somewhere in the middle between, let's say, 77 to 81%. And that's how many companies are beating earnings expectations going into this earnings season. So despite all of the drama we've had in the software names, Uber, Shopify, Airbnb, Meta, earnings on a fundamental basis have been very, very good. Fundamental driver of earnings Q1 2024 is really, really good. Now, a lot is left to be desired with, let's say, guidance, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. In the year and now, earnings are good and they have improved starkly compared to the same time last year. Now, where does that leave us with valuation? This is the S&P 500 PE ratio currently sitting in 19.82. Let's call it 20 times. That's on a forward basis, sitting at about 26 times on a trailing 12 month basis. The Schiller PE CAPE ratio is a 33 times. This right here is the 30 year average. This is where we are right now. You can see the S&P 500 dividend yield 1.5%, price to book 4x price to free cash flow 15x relative to its counterpart the 30 year average at 1.99 3 and 11 times so the s p 500 relatively speaking to the 30 year average is expensive on a relative basis a lot left to be desired with this type of analysis i hate looking at relative valuation i think absolute valuation is far more superior that being said this is the data right here and it's not something we should brush off and that being said, you do look at this data and the S&P 500 is relatively overvalued. Now, where does that actually leave us with returns for the future? This right here is S&P 500 annual returns 10 years forward. And then the S&P 500 normalized PE on a gap basis. And essentially, this will tell us where the PE is and what returns we can expect relative to history using the line of best fit. Now, it's not perfect but it is something that we can use and it will give us the statistical average. And based on where we are right now, right here, April, 2024, at the current trailing 12 month PE, you actually see that the S&P 500 is expected to return 0% over the next 10 years. That means you're gonna get a very choppy market. However, we do use the forward earnings, which is about 20 to 19 times, right? You're probably looking at something closer to four to five percent returns over the next 10 years. Is it stellar? No, it's not. And that's why when you do get major dips, major corrections, major bear markets 
in the stock market, you need to buy with both hands and just sit through the volatility because that's where you get insanely outsized returns. At the 2022 lows, the S&P 500 was trading right here at 15 and your returns in the S&P 500 would have been closer to 10 than they were to 5% according to this data. Now let's switch gears, talk about a completely different indicator. This is Bofa's regime indicator and essentially it just tells us what cycle we're in. Are we in early cycle, mid cycle, late cycle, or a recession period? Now this indicator right here improved for the fourth straight month in April to its highest level since February, 2023, and it is still firmly in the recovery phase. And during the recovery phase, what you want to own is income, so bonds, a little bit of credit, as well as mid caps, 40%, 30% weight. And I'm assuming the rest is cash. So you'd be holding 30% cash. What does this allocation look like on a more granular level? Well, you can see it right here. Both will want you to hold value. Again, we're looking at the recovery phase. Both will want you to hold value, small size, high risk. And that value, small size, high risk is in the mid cap and income sector. So you probably look at stuff like mid caps, S&P 400, maybe S&P 600 as well. And then high yield bonds, maybe corporate credit over government bonds and then hold cash where you can. So based on both as regime cycle where we are right now, this is what your portfolio allocation should look like. A little bit of equity, a little bit of bonds, a ton of cash to buy on the way up. And that actually seems pretty prudent. I would actually agree with that. So just some very interesting allocation strategies here from both. Use it if you want. Don't use it if you don't want to, but you have the data nonetheless. All right, guys, we got the latest GDP now estimate for 2024 Q2. Very, very interesting. Just last week, we were sitting here at 3.1. We've seen a huge uptick all the way to 4.1% here in GDP. That's a stark difference compared to just last week and even the 1.6% print we got on the official seasonally adjusted GDP numbers. This is also well above the blue chip consensus here, which is predicting about a 2% print here in the second quarter. So even at the median blue chip consensus, GDP is still looking very, very strong and this economy continues to chug forward. At the same time, supporting economic growth, or I should say an offspring of pretty strong GDP is coverage ratios. Quarter to date coverage ratio stands at 3.5x. This is the first increase in two years. Now, for those of you that don't know, if a coverage ratio increase it just means that a company has more money to cover their debt and the interest payment on that debt. You can actually see that coverage ratios has come down here since 2022. That had to do with the rate hike regime the Fed had in place, and that has since bottomed. And we've seen a trough year in the fourth quarter of 2023 and an uptick year in the first quarter of 2024. And oftentimes when we do see this trough bottom uptick, it often is an indication of higher than expected future earnings and we can go on quite extended runs. Essentially, what this is telling us is that firms have more money in their pockets to pay off interest or that interest expense is less. And you can see here when we bottomed in 2013, you know, we had a massive, massive rally and then like a flat time here all the way into 2015. We then had two quarters down revisions here in 2016 and then a massive, massive rally. And for those of you that know, 2013 all the way to 2020 was a very, very good time for stocks. Then here at the end of 2020 into 2021, after the pandemic, we saw a huge flurry in coverage ratios because interest rates were very low. Companies were making a ton of money due to fiscal stimulus. And then we did see the rate hikes implemented and that did come down. So whenever this does peak up like they did here in 2013, 2016, 2021, we often see sharp rallies in the S&P 500, and that's because companies just have more money. When companies have more money, it's often an indication that earnings are coming in good, margins are expanding, and that's really, really good for equities as a whole. Now, we have some commentary here from Bofa on stagflation. I just thought I'd read this to you guys. It's some of the most interesting commentary I've ever read in a while. Now, they say, we find stagflation narratives to be premature because one of three components of that backdrop is high unemployment. That is not present today. A second requirement is the slowing of economic growth, which is somewhat ambiguous because GDP, after stripping our trade and inventories, and we spoke about this in one of last week's video, GDP after stripping our trade and inventory is relatively solid at 2.8%. Unless the labor market falters markedly, it'll be difficult for stagflation to gain ground. And that is very, very self-explanatory. Stagflation requires higher inflation, lower growth, lower unemployment. 
The labor market right now is very, very solid. GDP is very, very solid. Look at GDP now at 4.1%. The stagflation narrative is a bit premature. Does that mean it could materialize 100% but as it is right now? With the data we have right now, it is premature to say so, and it might never materialize. Now, looking up here, last week's hawkish head fake by the Fed brought some relief to markets on edge due to recent data flow and Fed speak going into the conference. Powell made it clear that even with the recent lack in disinflation progress, monetary policy was sufficiently restrictive and will continue to operate with long and variable lags. He underscored how seeing inflation decline substantially for a year, the Fed has returned its focus to its dual mandate of stable jobs and prices, not just stable prices. This returned a sense of calm to jury markets that were fearing future hikes on the table. And that's just the thing. Part of the reason why we had the pullback, that 5% drawdown in the S&P 500, is because yields were rising and there was this fear that potentially hikes were going to put back on the table in 2024. Powell made it clear that that was not going to happen. And that's why we actually got quite a lot of the relief rally here. A lot of this rally in the last two to three months was predicated on the macro as well as the fundamental. Looking at technical charts, there was just no way you would have known that any of these moves are going to happen unless you were paying attention to the macro, unless you were paying attention to the fundamental like earnings, like the Fed. Guys, looking at Gamma, literally nothing has changed. The levels are pretty much the exact same. Go and watch yesterday's daily recap video. If I can remember, I'll link it up here. Yesterday's recap video will tell you everything you need to know. It's nothing has changed. Now, looking at a couple of other charts. Now, these are both the charts right here. We look at these every single week because 78% of fund managers have access to both as research. They see these charts every single week, and it's a great edge to have just to see what they're looking at. So this is the S&P 500 at the top and the U.S. high yield option spread, the OAS. Credit markets remain benign. We view the U.S. high yield option adjusted spread OAS as a leading indicator for the U.S. equity market. Yesterday's 6th of May move was another new low within a cyclical lagging trend for this credit spread. This is a bullish leading indicator that supports the case for a 2024 summer rally into the SPX. Pretty much what this is happening is that credit spreads continue to remain tight, continue to go lower. This is the option adjusted spread as the S&P 500 has actually pulled back and made a rally. So, you know, if this does continue to go lower as we are breaking key levels here in the OAS, that probably means more upside, particularly in the summer here for the S&P 500. Very, very interesting chart. Now, this right here is the S&P 500 and the Williams range, the weekly chart. A quick downward spike for weekly Williams percentage range on the S&P 500 out of overbought negative 20 in mid-April, followed by a move back into overbought late April, looks consistent with a tactical dip within a cyclical bull market. First SPX price and weekly WRPR supports are 4953 and negative 25.63 respectively. Essentially, what the Williams percentage range is telling us relative to the S&P 500 is that the dip we're seeing is just a very small dip in what is a cyclical bull market. So this is just a bull market dip and we do want to be buying into these dips particularly at the 49.53 level and we probably got to there at the low of the dip this is where i was saying buy with everything you have that coincides with the negative 25.63 respectively but we have actually piled a lot of those losses back and we do get these dips uh, in you know cyclical bull markets they happen and they're just great dip buying opportunities now looking at the S&P 500 and the percentage of S&P 500 stocks reaching new 52 week highs and new 52 week lows so high burst lows and we can actually see right here that the change of S&P 500 stocks hitting new 52 week highs confirmed the cyclical bull market from the October 22 low into late March the April dip did not see cracks emerge from an expansion of from an expansion in new 52 week lows which we view as positive so long story short this dip in April was not that scary stocks continued to make highs we saw a minor dip in lows but a lot of stocks continued to make highs particularly at the start and end of April and that is why we're actually seeing the S&P 500 move higher and this is a really good chart and this is why we actually always look at these new highs and new lows 52 week highs 52 week lows dashboards on this channel because they're great indicators and it was part of the reason why I said don't fear the dip at the dip now, next chart. This right here is the S&P 500 and the 10-day moving average of the spread between 52-week highs and 52-week lows in the S&P 500. Very, very interesting. A bearish divergence for the 10-day moving average of the spread between new 52-week highs and new 52-week lows in March preceded a dip 
For the SPX in April, the correction for this indicator has held a key support near zero, keeping the trend for new highs bullish relative to new lows. So we have seen a tactical bearish divergence right here after we had a bullish breakout. However, the corrective fades holds the zero area. So it holds this line right here, which is very, very bullish. And normally when it does, that's often a sign that we do actually go higher. And that probably means higher price action for the S&P 500, particularly if we can go ahead and recapture this bullish breakout zone. Guys, but if you've made it up until here, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell, like this video and leave a comment for the algorithm. Cheers.